Right. So we're going to move on to chapter six then. Chapter six is a tour of the cell. We're going to look at cells. All right. We're going to look at what cells are made of and how cells function. First, I want to show you a movie. Now, this is a phenomenal movie. Um, as a result of advances in computer animation, computer graphics, and our much better understanding of how the cell works, we're able to put together animations showing molecules how they really look, what they really look like inside living cells. All right? And you're going to get a look at what goes on inside one of your cells. All right? It's an amazing movie clip. The music's really good too. Yeah. Yeah, I like the music. Now, you hopefully, are, when you first watch this movie, you might say, I have no clue what's going on. Don't know. But it's kind of cool or it's kind of weird. Right? But after we've talked about the cell, you should be able to look back at this movie and I'll play it to you again and understand everything that's going on. Okay? Now, remember, what you're going to look at is inside a cell and you're primarily looking at parts of the cell that are made up of molecules. All right? Now, you're going to see some molecules in some bizarre shapes and doing some bizarre things, all right? And all of those molecules are sort of suspended in the sort of semi-gel-like inside of the cell called the cytoplasm or cytosol, okay? All right, you ready? This is inside a capillary and you've got red blood cells and this is a white blood cell and this is the surface of a white blood cell and the molecules on the surface of a white blood cell and an endothelial cell. That's pretty remarkable, isn't it? So all of those were big molecules or parts of your cell made up of molecules. 
Now, did you see that big sack getting dragged mm -hmm. by that molecule? It looked like it was walking. That's just a molecule. It's called a motor protein. And as a result of its shape changing, it can drag that big sack, which is a vesicle, along that track, which is a microtubule. Did you see molecules getting built up from their parts and torn down? Yeah? All right. So I think at the end of this chapter, you should be able to look at that movie and understand everything that's going on. Identify every single one of those structures and molecules. All right, so let's look at concept one then. Organisms are made of cells. Living organisms are made of cells. One or more cell. Okay, all organisms are made of one or more cells. Now I want you to think about the cell as the simplest unit of matter that can be considered alive. So based on that definition, we would consider a virus not to be alive. And some folks consider viruses to be alive. That's kind of a philosophical question, really. What is important is how do viruses work and how do cells work. But let's think about cells, the simplest unit of, ma of life, and it's the, the smallest unit that can be considered alive. Now, cells can differ from one another. Right? There can be a huge difference from one cell to another, but all cells share, share certain common features. So a bacterial cell is very different to a neuron in your brain, yeah? which is very different still to a plant cell or a fungal cell. But they all share certain features. So this is a colorized scanning electron micrograph of a neuron, a nerve cell. And here you've got a muscle cell. Okay? And the nerve cell sort of ends at the muscle cell, all right? So signals from your brain travel along this neuron and are then transmitted a signal from the neuron to muscle cells. And that's literally what's causing your eyes to follow me and look at the screen and enables your muscles in your hand to form words, all right? It's your brain deciding, all right, what nerve impulses am I gonna send? And then when it gets to the end of that nerve impulse, what muscles is it causing to contract? All right. So when you're paralyzed, is it the nerve impulses that are affected by that? Oh. So I think paralysis can happen at a lot of different levels. One form of paralysis would be where you've got a severing your spinal cord. So whatever's going in your brain can't make it to the muscles because there's a disconnect. It's literally like taking the wires and cutting them. Yep. There's other forms of paralysis where you've got toxins or chemicals which interfere with nerve impulse travel or which interfere with the communication of that nerve cell with that muscle cell. All right, what have we got here then? Ostrich. Ostrich, yeah. What do you find ostriches? They do. I thought he was going to oh, I thought someone was going to say Chandler. Chandler, ostrich festival. <laughs> yeah. Rooster Coburn's ostrich farm on the way to Tucson. Yeah, but they have monster trucks too, which is really weird. You find them at the zoo as well. Where do ostriches normally naturally live? India, I don't know. Continent of Africa. Okay. All right, continent of Africa. You'll find a lot of them in Africa. So I took this picture in South Africa. Here's an ostrich, and um, she's guarding a nest with eggs. There's clouds and mountains behind it. So it's clouds coming over mountains. It's gorgeous, I've got to tell you. If you get a chance to go, go. This summer, tickets to South Africa, about the cheapest I've seen them, ever. All right, and I've been, fly I've been flying there for more than 20 years, and they're about the cheapest I've ever seen them. It's How cheap? Yeah, it's about $1,200 round trip. Wow, that's actually not wow. bad at all. That's insanely cheap. Okay, the first trip I made there, it was $2,400. It's two long-haul flights. <coughs> Phoenix to London, London to South Africa. And how, did, how long did you stay there? In South Africa? I've been there a lot of times. But I mean the $2,400. Oh. I guess I've never flown before actually, so like if you stay there for a longer period of time, does it cost more? Most tickets are good for a maximum of a year, right? So, max a year. So, get out your pennies or your credit card, go on a trip this summer, why not? Be adventurous. Tickets to Nairobi were less, were about $1,000 round trip to Phoenix. Crazy.
Anyway, go to South Africa and see stuff like this. And this is in the wine region of South Africa, which is stunningly gorgeous. All right, why, well, yep. When you get off the plane, where do you, like, what would you do? Like, if I were to buy tickets to South Africa, or to Africa, and then I just, I What would you do? Like, well, I, I would get a guidebook, do a guidebook, do a little bit of research before you go, read up on the country, yep. And when you start to do that, you'll get an idea of where you want to go. Talk, talk to people that have traveled there. If you go to South Africa, there's a, there's a bus called the Baz Bus. And it's kind of a hop on, hop off bus, and it goes along the coast, and you buy a ticket. Hostels are pretty cheap in South Africa. It's a great place to visit. It's very geared towards backpacker tourism. Okay. All right. And of course, you can grab one of those eggs if it's been developing for a while, and you can pick the shell off and Oh, you find a big ugly foot inside, right? Wait, you, you crack this open and it's about ready to hatch. So it lives. Yeah, look. See? Aww. It totally lived. I got to be a dad before I was a real dad. <laughs> <laughs> so, ostrich eggs, right? That's the world's biggest cell. So, this was one that wasn't so lucky took the egg, cut it in half, and guess, what do you do with a, an ostrich egg if you cut it, cut it in half like that? Tupperware. Yeah, you make a giant omelette, right? So you make a huge omelette. It's equivalent to about two dozen hen's eggs. Wow. Okay? Whoa. That's a lot of eggs. It's a lot of eggs. You can stand on them, too. You can stand on an ostrich egg. Yeah, they'll hold you weight as long as you get the right axis. So an ostrich egg is very mild. It's not strong. An ostrich meat is also very, very mild hardly any fat. So whatever you cook ostrich meat in sort of takes on the flavor of whatever flavorings you add, right? It makes a terrible hamburger because there's so little fat in it. Mm -hmm. That's one thing you can do in South Africa, right? Crack an ostrich egg, eat an ostrich egg, and have an ostrich steak. How cool would that be? <laughs> but it doesn't taste great. I'll tell you what I'd recommend, Eland. Eland tastes really good. Gemsbok tastes really good, and Springbok tastes good as well. So you, they're antelope. So if you go to a game park, all the animals that you see in the daytime, you can eat at night. No way. If you go to the right restaurant. Yeah. Yeah. I've eaten zebra and crocodile and... How yeah. the crocodile? It was all right. It's kind of greasy. Yeah. How about the zebra? Zebra was good. Alligators. Sorry? Greasy. Sorry? It's greasy, isn't it? Yeah. 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 All right. So there's the world's yeah. biggest <laughs> egg. World's biggest animal cell, sorry, in the world's biggest egg. So that's the biggest cell, all right, is a bird's egg, an ostrich egg, and the smallest cell is a mycoplasma. Now, it's a kind of bacterium that doesn't have a cell wall. So the cell can kind of like creep around a little bit, but they are tiny. Right. They can get down to as little as 0 0.1 micrometers. Now, you would write 0 0.1 micrometers like this. Or you can write it out in full micrometer. You can see the scale bar on that electron micrograph. You can see what 0.5 micrometers looks like. All right. So they were kind of on the large size for mycoplasmas, or on the average size. There are mycoplasmas that go down as small as 0.1 micrometer. All right, so let's have a look at how we study cells then, all right? How we study cells. So one way we study cells, of course, is with a light microscope. And you've had a good, good hands-on experience with light microscopes so far. So the first cells were discovered by a guy called Robert Hooke in 1665, and he made his own compound microscope. All right. And there's a picture of it. Look how he focused the light. He had a flask of water and an oil lamp. Of course, there was no electricity then. And he used that and another lens to focus light on the specimen. And he made lenses for his microscope, hand polished them. And he was able to see big cells under the microscope. So this is the sort of microscope that you're familiar with. Yeah. Very similar to the ones that we use. Obviously, we've come a long way since Robert Hooke's. Or you can get quite sophisticated and quite fancy. It's still a light microscope. But this has some manipulation tools, and it's got a camera, and it's hooked up to a screen, and 
um, ways that you can record the imagery and so on. All right. So in this case, they're, I'm not quite sure what they're doing, but the end on that monitor just here, this would be the end of a micro pipette. Okay, tip of a micro pipette, teeny, 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 tiny, and there you've got what looks like a cluster of cells. All right. Or you can get even more fancy. This is a confocal microscope. Right, we're going to talk a little bit about the different types of microscopy and the different types of microscope. Okay, but confocal microscopy, well, we start to get to use lasers as well as just regular light. We can add not just stains that you've added, but we can add fluorescent dyes that fluoresce different colors under ultraviolet light. And we can use ultraviolet stains that are tagged to molecules which only attach to certain molecules inside the cell. That way, for example, over here, this green, we've got whatever this is inside the cell, we've got a molecule attached to a green fluorescent dye. That molecule will attach to a certain, oops, a certain structure or molecule inside the cell and you can use a different colored dye attached to a different molecule which will attach to a different substance inside the cell and then a red one to a different substance still. And then you can shine ultraviolet light on them. The green one will fluoresce green, the orange one orange, red one red. And then you can use computers to put all of these images together and that way you get a picture of the cell with different molecules in the cell tagged different colors. It's really pretty cool. All right, so this is just typical bright field microscopy. All right, the sort of microscopy that you've done with an unstained specimen. All right. What cells are these? I've got to read this out of the book. Human cheek is it cheek cells? Yeah. All right, so these are human cheek cells. Um, we've not done that. We could very easily, though. You can just simply scrape the cheek cells tap the scraping onto a little drop of water on the microscope slide, put it under the scope, and that's what you'll see. In fact, a bit later in the semester, we're going to take your cheek cells and we're going to extract the DNA from them. And we'll do a lab with the DNA there. All right, or you can take the cheek cells and you can add a stain. All right, so cells often take up stains and we use stains in order to differentiate the cells or parts of the cell from their surroundings. As we saw in lab today, you can use methylene blue Nuclei take up a lot of methylene blue, and you can use that to differentiate um, the nuclei from the surroundings. This is a different kind of microscopy called phase contrast microscopy. All right, it still uses light, but it enables you to give different contrast to different areas of the cell, especially around edges. And it, again, it enables you to depict certain parts of the cell or certain areas of the cell from the surroundings or other parts of the cell. So this is called differential interference contrast. Again, it's just another technique to give contrast to edges and different areas of the cell so you can pick up different parts of the cell more readily. All right, so there, these are three different ways to look at cells using a light microscope, all right? Just by adding a stain or not adding a stain or changing something called the substage condenser to give you phase contrast or other forms of light microscopy. So. This is using fluorescent dyes or fluorescent stains, and this is a uterine cell. Look at the scale bar, 10 micrometers is quite small. And so we've got a blue stain for the nucleus, a green stain, and I'm not quite sure it's green and yellow stains are differentially staining. I imagine the green is part of the cytoskeleton, but I don't know which part. Does it tell you? Yeah, the cytoskeletons in green. So these are different molecules within the cell that we've differentially stained with different color fluorescent stains. Okay. All right. So this is a kind of microscopy. Now we're getting into still using light microscopy, but we're using fluorescent stains and we're using computer software to compile images to give us clarity. So with this one, what's happening is we can take images 
in layers through the cell. All right. Now, when we do that, it can look very blurry. But when we use a computer to enhance these different layers and then put these layers, flatten the layers down, then you can get an image which is very crisp and very clear. You can take sort of the blurriness out of it, if that makes sense. Again, this is confocal epifluorescence microscopy. I think the way that works is you look at the sample from um, a couple of different perspectives and you can piece together almost a three-dimensional image and again you use complex computer software to get an image that looks really nice and crisp compared to this. It's nervous tissue. So there are neurons in there and there are support cells. Again, each tag with a different stain fluorescent dye so you can differentiate one cell type from another. So there's different types of fluorescence microscopy. All right. It's really come an awful long way. Okay, so a couple of terms that I want to make sure you know. Magnification. So this seems to be a little bit of, of a black box. In my 182 class, they have to look at images and they have to write the magnification of a drawing they make from that image. And they're sometimes a little confused about what the magnification is or means. So it's simply a ratio of the object's real size to whatever the size of the image is. All right. So if I had something whose real size was about this big and the image I've got is about that big, then my magnification is probably about Maybe about times five. Something like that. Okay. What about if I've got you and I've drawn an image of you and you're about that big? What's the magnification? It's not negative. Is it times one? Times one would be life size, right? Oh, I have an image of you exactly the same size as you. It would be a decimal. All right? Now that's probably about 10 centimeters. Yep. So I know. Anybody two meters tall in the class? Oh. I think you've got to be, right? You've got to be as well, I, I would imagine. All right, so how many centimeters in two meters? How many centimeters in a meter? Thank you. 100 centimetres in a metre. Did you say that? Yeah, You've got to say it louder. 100 centimetres in a metre. Don't you remember the metrics lab we did? <laughs> the metrics homework I had you do? It's one of those things where you cram and purge, right? Yeah. Don't cram and purge. It's a waste of time. What does purge mean in that context? Here's what cramming and purging is, right? There's a part of your brain called the hippocampus, which is where short-term memory goes. And short-term memory goes, and it's like... It's a bit like this. When you come home from shopping, you put all your groceries out on, on the kitchen counter. Short term. Then what you do is you get really nicely organized. Yep. Presumably. I don't know. Are any of you guys that organized? But you get them organized. You put them where things need to go. You put some things in the fridge, some things in the cupboard, some things you open up, some things you... Whatever. But you get them nicely organized. They go to long-term storage, right? Some things go in the freezer. Yep. Cramming and purging is this. You cram for an exam. You put everything into that hippocampus, that short-term memory. And then as soon as you're done with the exam, you go, <sighs> and it just disappears like it wasn't even there because it's replaced with other short-term memories. It never makes its way into long-term or not much of it. That's the worst, worst way of studying ever, right? If that's the pattern you've into, you've trained your brain not to go from hippocampus to long-term memory. You trained it to stay in there, and then pew, goodbye. So next time you've got to know it, you've got to relearn it. In fact, you've got to relearn it time and time again. Wouldn't that be crazy? Imagine every time you got into a car, you had to relearn how to drive the car. What a waste, what a waste of a life that would be. Yeah? But driving a car goes into long-term and other sorts of long-term memory. So don't cram and purge. We all do it to some degree. Try not to. All right, there's a human. 
These guys are about two meters tall, 200 centimeters. This is about 10 centimeters. What's the magnification? What is it? 20. Is it 20? Is this 20 times bigger than this? 0.002. What times 10 is going to give you 200? 20th is what as a decimal? Is it 0.2? No, 0.0. Is it 0.02? No. That's two hundredths. What is one twentieth as a decimal? That's a half. That's two tenths. That's one tenth. What's half of one tenth? Is that right? Yeah. Is five one hundredths one twentieth? Yeah. Hip hip hooray! <laughs> that was painful. So what's our magnification? Okay, I get a better understanding now why magnification is so enigmatic to my 182 students. <laughs> Are you going to tell them how you should bad do that it is? With, them. <laughs> with all the cramming and purging, it's gone. <laughs> it's already gone. It's already gone. <laughs> All right, move on. <laughs> resolution. So think about resolution as the minimum distance between two points where you can distinguish them as separate points. That's what resolution is. All right, and different microscopes have different resolutions based on their optics, their lenses, or the light used and other tricks that we can pull. Okay. So, I'm going to draw two dots on the board. At the front, how many, how many dots does that look like? Two. So at the back, there's, you can probably only see one dot, can't you? Yeah. yeah. All right. So you can't resolve those as two dots. At the front, you, you probably can see them as just two dots. I drew them about as close together as I possibly could. But the further away you are, you have a harder time recognizing them as, those, as the separate dots. Okay, so the limit of resolution of a light microscope is about 0.2 micrometers, all right? 0.2 micrometers. It's the limit of resolution of the light microscope. Now, one micrometer is one millionth of a meter. I'm afraid to delve into that deeper. To be perfectly honest. So that means with a light microscope, we can see some very small things, but there's a limit to how small we can go because we can't resolve them as separate objects. Okay. So we can go down and we can see some very small bacterial cells, but once the cells get too tiny, we can't resolve them. We can't see two cells. We, can't, we may only see one particle where it's made of a number of smaller things. We can't resolve them. So a light microscope, about the maximum magnification is about 1,000 times. Now you can go a little bit above that with a light microscope, but you're limited by what light can do. I know in lab we didn't look at oil immersion microscopy, but those of you that go ahead and take micro, you'll look at some oil immersion and some things that we can do with a light microscope which sort of just increase its magnification beyond which it theoretically should be able to do. So we can see small bacteria, and we can see the parts, the small parts of some cells. Like you've already seen the nuclei inside cells, haven't you? 
you've already seen a chloroplast inside some cells. But we couldn't see the mitochondria, could we, in today's lab? Didn't see any of those. They're too tiny. All right, so let's have a look at this graphic then. And you can see things with your unaided eye right down to about probably half a millimetre or slightly smaller, if you can picture that. All right, think about a microscope slide. It's about one millimetre thick about half or maybe two-tenths of that, a fifth of that, is what you can see down with the naked eye. All right? So if I gave you a little test tube and I put some tiny little organisms in that tube, as long as they were about mm, a fifth of a millimetre or bigger, you could see them. All right? <coughs> Much smaller than that, you can't really see them. Light microscopes, obviously we use those to look at things that are maybe a, a millimetre or a centimetre right down to maybe look at see we've got super resolution microscopy all right with a light microscope you can fairly easily see red blood cells they're not huge but red blood cells are like five or so micrometers so they're about here all right and then we're going to look at the components of cells all right smaller than red blood cells go inside a cell maybe the mitochondria, we couldn't see them today, the plant mitochondria are tiny, but you can see animal mitochondria, which are bigger, all right? Maybe about one micrometer, and bacterial cells are maybe on the order of one or two micrometers. Super resolution microscopy, you can get smaller. We don't have that here. All right, so then you can use an electron microscope to look at things that you can't with a light microscope. You've got much more magnification and resolving power with an electron microscope. So an electron microscope, you can see down to proteins and even some fairly large-ish molecules, all right, with an electron microscope. All right, what I like about this is it gives you sort of the whole range from 10 meters right down to 0.1 nanometer, all right? So now you've got the relative size of some of the smallest bacteria. There are, what kind of tiny bacteria are we talking about? mycoplasmas yeah and then we're talking about viruses will be the next sort of smallest you know interesting biological entity and then we're looking at parts of the cell molecules like ribosomes and proteins and lipids okay all right has anybody ever seen this scale of the universe yeah it's really cool I want to show it to you because it gives you an idea of the scale of things that we're going to look at Definitely, definitely do British English. <laughs> no, what is American English anyway? <laughs> Don't fall asleep, it's very relaxing. Let's go in. Giant earthworm is. What? A bit longer than you. Dodo birds are big. Ooh, guess what that Rafflesia is? World's biggest flower. Smells like rotting flesh. Looks like it to attract flies. No, we're zooming in. size of this viewport. This this is the viewport. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So you've got there's the size of the chicken's egg compared to the viewport, hummingbird compared to the viewport. Okay. Yeah. Right, let's go in. Duckweed. Right. <laughs> Duckweed is a little it's a little aquatic plant. You see it growing on the surface of ponds. The leaves are very tiny. You can see how big the leaves are relatively. All right, so now this is the scale I want you to look at. Largest bacteria, 
Look at that dust mite. They are tiny. Grain of salt, grain of sand. There's an LCD pixel. It's getting a bit more thickness of a piece of paper. What's this guy? An amoeba, paramecium. We've seen these, haven't we, under the microscope? All right, so now let's see what human ovum, human egg looks like, human hair. Smallest object visible to the naked eye. I don't know. I mean, but that's what how big it is. Which means that if you had a test tube with a human egg in, you could just about see it if you had great eyes. All right, as a tiny speck. Sorry? According to this, you can. Let me think about it. You can see the thickness of a human hair. A human ovum is, a human egg is actually fairly big. Compared to a skin cell, much smaller. Mist droplet. Let's keep going. Width of a silk fiber. Now we've got a cell nucleus, red blood cell, chromosomes, chloroplast, white blood cell. You get a good idea of scale, yeah? How big relatively things are. Chromosome, which is made of DNA. There's an E. coli, which is a very small bacterium. Now we get down to sort of the virus and the molecule level. There's our HIV virus, hepatitis B virus, tiny A. That blows me away that we can make something that tiny, right? It's a transistor gate. Know, it's in some sort of electronics. There's our phospholipids in the cell membrane. There's the DNA molecule we just looked at. There's an alpha helix found where? Secondary structure of proteins. Although I don't think that's what that is because I think that should be a lot. An alpha helix is bigger than that, I believe. Phospholipid molecule. Glucose molecule. All right, now we're on atoms. Good, now you're all like hypnotized. Some little leprechaun came in and stole your wallets. Sorry? Where's what? Well, I was talking. There. If you ever wanted to feel insignificant and meaningless, just watch this a couple of times. <laughs> okay. All right. The link's there in the PowerPoints. Click it. Have fun. It's it's kind of a fun thing to play with, isn't it? All right. But you get an idea of scale, yeah? How big cells are. All right. If you want to go see an elephant, where are you going to go see an elephant? Don't. Don't say a zoo. Yeah. You're going to say Africa, right? Well, they have Asian elephants too. I know we do. You can go. You can go to Asia, and you can go anywhere on the planet and see an elephant as long as it's in its native habitat, right? In which case, you've got to go to Asia or Africa. I've been to a zoo. Yes. No, I'll just go to the zoo. Plenty of zoos. All right. So electron microscopes. Then we use those to look at things that are too small to look at with the light microscope. We want to get more detail. And they were first introduced in the 1950s. They're similar yet fundamentally different to a light microscope. They don't use light. They use electrons. Now, when electrons move as independent particles, they move, they have a wave-like properties. And they have a wavelength. And their wavelength is a lot less than the different wavelengths of different light in white light, invisible light. 
So they've got a shorter wavelength, is the point. And as a result, they've got much better resolving power. They can resolve down to 0.2 nanometers. That's 1,000 times better than a light microscope, down to a billionth of a meter. All right? Light microscopes, good to about 0.2 micrometers, about a millionth of a meter. Electron microscopes, 1,000 times better, down to 0.2 nanometers, about a billionth of a meter. I'm seeing a few glossed over looks. Do you remember back from the first week? Mm -hmm. I'm sure you do because none of you would dare cram and purge, at least ever again, right? This is 10 to the negative 6, a nanometer is 10 to the negative 9 meters, yeah. okay? A thousand times smaller. And the electron microscope, you can very clearly see viruses. You can clearly, well, clearly, fairly clearly see proteins, which are enormous molecules, and even some smaller molecules and proteins, some lipids, for example. Teeny tiny. Now, we use electron microscopes to study the cell structure, the structure inside cells, all right? And we call that cytology. So a lot of the images I'm going to show you are electron micrographs. Now, if they've got a lot of color to them and they don't look three-dimensional, then they're probably an epifluorescence confocal micrograph, a light micrograph taken with fluorescent stains. If they look three-dimensional and they're colored, it's an electron micrograph, and I'll show you what that kind of micrograph that is. And usually if it's black and white and it looks flat, then it's a transmission electron micrograph. All right? But I'll show you what those are in, in just, just a moment. So some electron microscopes can be huge. right? There's a really big one. It's an older one, but it's a really big one. And some of them can be a lot smaller. All right? So there's a, a biologist looking in his electron microscope. The specimen is in that chamber. And what happens is you usually bombard the specimen with electrons. The electrons either bounce off or pass through, but you've got sensors in that chamber that are reading the electron either penetration or scatter, and then an image gets pieced together on a screen of whatever it is you're looking at. Yep. Is this when they like shoot it at the thing? They do shoot electrons oh. at, the, at the specimen, yep. yep. They've got an electron gun, but there's no one doing this. So is there bouncing on it's like an avalanche? Kind of. I'll show you. I'll show you. Hopefully it'll make sense when I show you. All right. So, scanning electron microscopes then. You can have an electron microscope that's a scanning electron microscope, and we sometimes abbreviate that to an SEM, scanning electron microscope. And what that does is it shoots a beam of electrons onto the surface of a specimen, and it generates an image that looks three-dimensional. Now usually what we do is we, or very often, is we'll coat the specimen with a metal like gold. Now sometimes you can just put the specimen in if it's a hard specimen and the electrons will bounce off. But gold is a very dense metal and gold's kind of remarkable. Gold's one of the few metals where we can get um, a layer so, so thin, incredibly thin, so you're literally getting a specimen and you're giving it a second skin of gold. And because it's so dense, the electrons bounce off very nicely. Right? So you can generate images like this. This is a scanning electron micrograph. Have anybody want to guess what these are? Viruses. That's a good guess and that's another good guess. They're not, but they're good guesses. Not sea urchins. They have pentamerous radial symmetry and you can't see that in this. But. Not beads. Oh, oh, it's not snot, it's not uh, pollen. Oh. Why would you do that? <laughs> Achoo, because people have allergies to pollen. <laughs> it was a subtle clue. <laughs> so pollen grains, aren't they amazing? They're really, really pretty. Now you can see those under the light microscope, but you don't get quite that detail. So there's different pollen grains. 
And in fact, you can identify plant species based on the pollen grains. We actually go into lake sediments, right? And we look at the pollen in the lake sediments to see what plants were like thousands of years ago. Yeah. What do you think this is? It is a virus. It's the, no, it's the avian flu virus. All right, avian flu one? virus, yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay, but it didn't make you jump to humans? I don't know. I think it did. Okay. What about these? Spores. These are bacteria, bacterial cells. These are all scanning electron micrographs. See the way they're all in black and white, they're all three-dimensional? Now we can colorize them, all right? The colorizing is done with the computer afterwards, though. All right, what could this be? It's called a scolex. So it's the scolex of a tapeworm. And you can see the suckers and you can see the hooks. And it's how it holds on to your intestinal wall. Isn't that awesome? Got the hooks up here, and these are suckers that hold on. If you want to, if you, if you like this kind of stuff, just go onto Google, hit the images tab, and put in SEM Scolex, and you'll see some of the craziest looking Scolexes of different tapeworms. All right, they look like aliens. All right, so what's this one on the left? I don't expect you to guess, but have a guess. I don't expect you to get it right. Uh, Virus is not a bad guess. It's not. It's a foraminiferin. What? Now, a foraminiferin. But hold your horses. <laughs> so lime, limestone, all right, limestone rock is made up of these. Many, many, many of them compacted and squashed together. These are little microscopic organisms, foraminiferins, that live in the ocean, and they construct this, like, shell of calcium carbonate. And at certain points in the Earth's history, there were many of them in the oceans. And when they die, the cell goes away, but this is left. And they sink to the bottom. And they sink, and they sink, and they sink, and they build up in layers and enormous amounts of pressure, squashes, and crushes. And you end up with limestone rock. <laughs> All right? So how do they get these? Do they just, like, scrape them off? No, this right. is a... So you can get live frame and inferens, right? You can just go, literally, trawl a fine net through the ocean, and you'll pull these up. And you can look at them through the microscope. Okay. What's the one on the right? Like, it's like not a bad guess. An it's actually an aphid's head. What's an aphid? Aphid is a little bug, tree plant bug. I know you call everything that's got legs that stick out a bug, but that's not a correct use of the word <laughs> bug, really. All right. So aphids are true bugs. They are insects that have mouth parts like a hypodermic needle. And they stick it into plants to, to suck the juices. Or they stick it into you to suck your blood or another insect to suck insect hemolin. So there's an eye. There's an eye. Base of the antennae, base of the antennae, mouth parts. That's the base of the stylet, which is like a hypodermic needle, which would protrude down there. What about this one on the left? It's the eye of a fruit fly. Surface of a fruit fly's eye. They're just little little hairs that stick up. On their eyes? Yep, correct. Yeah. Sorry? Well, remember, it's a scanning electron micrograph. You can just take the fruit fly, give it a quick spray of gold, and then bombard it with electrons, make an image of the Wait. scatter pattern. So you guys, oh, never Sometimes with these insects, you can shove them in quickly. But here's the thing, the chamber that you use has to be evacuated. You've got to pull a vacuum on it. And so if you're a little fruit fly and you've got a liquid, lot of liquid inside you, when you pull the vacuum, that liquid boils and it can burst. That's okay. So sometimes we dry them out, coat them with gold. And <laughs> the one on the right-hand side is the shell or test of a diatom. You've seen diatoms in lab, right? That's what it looks like under an electron microscope, some of the species. Very elaborate. What about these? I don't care how clean your kitchen is, there are bacteria everywhere. These are the bacteria on the surface of a knife under an electron microscope. It's not that much, so 
right. So I don't know if this image is still in your textbook. I think it is. But the image in your textbook is now a colorized version of this. All right. So this is a scanning electron micrograph of what's the tissue? Cilia, from which tissue? Trachea. So this is your... Not esophagus. <laughs> if you feel this hard cartilage here, that's your trachea. Part of your trachea. The right way to say it, not trachea, trachea. Right? And it's made of these rings of cartilage, right? And it's lined with an epithelium. And the epithelium has these little structures on that look like that, little cilia, all right? And the cilia are busily beating upwards, all right? Because you swallow a lot of junk in the air, particle that gets trapped in mucus that in, in your lungs, and that mucus has to go somewhere. You don't want it to build up in your lungs. So the cilia beats, so it moves up to the back of your throat where you swallow it. And that's what the lining of your trachea looks like. Yeah. You know when you go to a car wash and there's those like thingies that like some running and stuff your car is out just I guess, a little bit. <laughs> All right, let's wrap it up there. <laughs>